Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back again talking about why most bass anglers fail when they try saltwater fishing. And before you get your little waders in a wad, don't worry. We're not saying that all bass anglers fail. They can't catch fish. It's that most of them fail. And, and failure to me means not catching as many fish as you deserve to catch, especially based on your knowledge and, and even the tackle and stuff that you probably already own. And in many cases, we, we, we basically just we take things that should be pretty simple and are simple and we just like confuse them and we just put way too much thought into it. And the reason I know is because that's what Luke and I did for many, many years. We were bass guys. We, you know, I was born in Tampa, but for the most part, lived most of my life in Winter Haven, Florida, where our office is today. And we bass fit. Luke was bass fishing every single day, pretty much. And when we made that transition over, it was tough. Like we struggled and in, in our, our own eyes, we failed. And um, so we had an email recently from Rob Newell, who's on here as well. And, and Rob had man, broke down what, what he's been doing. And we're like, wow, uh, kind of an impressive resume. And we're like, man, it'd be kind of neat to do some uh, in your, I think your, your word, Rob was like bass to bay kind of, you know, right. podcast and content and tips. And uh, like, yeah, we, we, we should, because for most of us, even me, I mean, I went bass fishing in the last seven days and I also went saltwater fishing. And there's a lot of us like that, that live closer. Justin, you're the same, right? You live right behind a pond where you test out some of our, our tackle and our lures. And there's many of us who are bass fishing just as often as we are saltwater fishing. So I thought this would be a great podcast and be super helpful, especially if, if you're decent at catching bass or maybe you're great at catching bass and, and you're struggling to catch as many inshore saltwater fish as you think you deserve. This will be really, really helpful. So Rob, uh, real quick, kind of give the background. What's, what's your story? I'm just a bass fishing reporter. You know, I, I report on all the tours. Um, I, I've worked for BASS, FLW. I currently work for Major League Fishing and the Bass Pro Tour. And I'm very fortunate to know a lot of the professional anglers, top pros, bass fishermen. Um, but, you know, I, I get to spend time with them. I get to watch them on the water. And it's always a learning experience every day that you're out there. I've also had the opportunity to cover redfish tournaments, and I've gotten to know some of the saltwater guys um, back in the day of the Redfish Cup and the Redfish Series. And through a lot of bass fishing and through a lot of saltwater fishing, I've watched kind of the common denominators between catching bass and catching, you know, inshore, more inshore type fish. And I just think it's something that kind of goes overlooked from time to time, how easy it is to take bass fishing stuff and apply it to inshore fishing. So that's kind of, you know, I saw the kind of stuff you got you guys do. Um, I read some comments about, you know, guys that are that bass fish and, and like vacation down the Gulf of Mexico a couple of times a year and want to know how, how can I take my bass fishing knowledge and skills and apply it and uh, so I thought I'd just love to chime in and, and you know, say, hey, it's if, if you have some basic bass fishing skills, um, you know, casting, reading water, that kind of stuff. The sort of sort of the world is your oyster down at the coast inshore fishing. I mean, you already have all the skills you already have all 90 percent of the tackle in your garage to make this happen. It's just applying it and doing it a couple of times and you'll suddenly realize like. I'm not going to say inshore saltwater fishing is easy by any means, but when you see the train, you know, how you can apply some of your common denominators from bass fishing into inshore fishing, the light kind of comes on. And, and besides doing, uh, I mean, your, your name is everywhere in a lot of the, the bass fishing articles and interviews. You're also, you have a captain's license. I don't think it's active per se, right? But you have like a saltwater captain's license too. So you, you really do get both worlds. Yeah, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I, want, I thought I was going to be a guide for a living. That's what I thought I was going to do. So I went and got a captain's license and I've kept it up. I've kept it active, but I don't, I don't carry clients per se on a regular basis, you know, to fish. But it's just a nice feather in the cap, you know. Back in the good old days of, of saltwater fishing, everybody was captain this and, and captain that. Some of that's kind of gone away a little bit, but, you know, uh, having a captain's license. In fact, I'm in the process of renewing it right now. It's one of my projects this month. Too cool. All right, well, let's get into it. Uh, I would start off by saying, besides 
wearing their jerseys to try to catch redfish and uh, trout. What what are some of the biggest mistakes or, or maybe myths that the the bass angler is just overcomplicating things when when they go into inshore fishing? What what are you seeing is just what are a couple of things that just stand out as like man, I, I wish I could just tell them this. Well, the main thing is, is they, they start, to, I, I'm amazed at the number of guys, even some really top pros, but the number of people that come down to, to, to the beach, to vacation, spend a couple of weeks down there and they want to fish. And the first reaction is I want to go saltwater fishing. Where can I get some live bait? They live always want to buy live, live bait. bait. It's all about the live bait. Now, understandably, if you're going offshore for snapper, grouper, yeah, you're going to fish 200, 300 feet. But I'm amazed they're talking about fishing around in the bay. Where can I go get some shrimp? Where can I go get some live shrimp? You know, anybody that's netted any, you know, uh, greenies or anything that I can get a hold of. I'll buy them from like, man, you're a bass fisherman. You don't need to do all that, put it on the pop and cork and all that kind of thing. You, I mean, you, you have all the tools, you know, that you need. Um, I always hear the, another myth I hear all the time. Well, I'm not going to bring my bass gear because salt water will destroy it. It's not going to destroy it. Now, now, okay, let, let me say this. I wouldn't exactly bring my, you, you know, top, top of the line, <laughs> your seven or $800 dollar, uh, Daiwa Stees or something down to the coast to, you know, to, to fish with. But I think we all have in our, kind of in our repertoire of tackle, we all have kind of our first string and second string of bass tackle, right? I mean, you know, leave the real top end stuff at home, but there's plenty of middle of the road stuff that'll work in salt water. And guess what? Unless you dunk it, unless you drop it, if it goes overboard, as long as you use it a couple of days, rinse it off. We all kind of, you know, sprays they have today, like the, the line and lube stuff and the salt off, stuff like that. I mean, um, another one I hear all the time is I need to have a big boat. I'm going to salt water. I got to have a big boat. Where can I get a big boat to go out in the and some of the best fishing you can have in salt water is done poking around in a kayak right up next to the bank. I mean, that's simply not true. Um, a lot of them talk about tides. What about these tides? These tides are too confusing. It messes me up, all these tides, you know. And basically, if you're a bass fisherman, you understand water flow and you understand current. The current, and, or, or especially on, uh, like, up in the TVA, where uh, rivers are, you know, you have dams and they control the flow for power generation. When they turn on the power, everybody knows when the river's flowing, they're biting. It's really the same premise. Try and quit doing all these calculations. It's high over there. It's low over there. If it's coming in and it's flowing in, just read that water. If it's going out, flowing out, just read that water. And, um, you know, the last one I hear is like, well, I got to learn a whole bunch of knots. It's the same knots. I mean, learn you a good FG for, for, for fusing braid. Oh, he know, you know about the FG. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. The, I'm not saying I'm the best at tying it. I mean, I struggle with it sometimes, but the, uh, you know, a polymer and a good loop knot. I mean, all bass fishermen have all those already in their arsenal. I, that's good stuff. I, I met someone here recently in, in town in Winter Haven, who's a big bass fisherman and they found out what, what I do. And they're, they got real excited. Like, man, I've always wanted to do that. I, I, and I think the words were, I just don't know like where to start when I'm out there. Like it just intimidating and I said, well, like, where do you start when you're bass fishing? You're great at bass fishing. Like, what do you look for? And, and it didn't really understand my question. I was like, like, what, what types of area do you fish? And he's like, well, I, I concentrate on finding structure. And I was like, that's it. Like, th like that, that's it. Like the same mm -hmm. thing, find the structure. You can nowadays with these fancy satellite maps on the Google, <laughs> a, you can sit there and actually see structure. And we've got tons of podcasts and little webinars we've put together finding that 90 10 zone. And I was like, man, if you just did that, it would be so less intimidating, right? If you just focus on, on structure, Justin, Luke, what, what, what things do, do you guys hear? Um, and, and, and Luke, maybe going back in time in our struggles, what, what were some things that, uh, that constantly came up that we just wish someone had told us when we were struggling bass addicts mine mine was live bait i i thought i truly believe that if i didn't have a blacked out live well i wasn't going to catch fish and i truly believe it so the first hour of every trip was dedicated some i mean many cases less but sometimes over an hour uh, of time was dedicated to catching the bait and then and then so i basically missed the best bite because i'll be like the twilight hours and so i'd be focused in the best bite on catching the bait and then I'm, I'm not, I was, I was only saltwater fishing on vacation. 
So I was never doing it on a consistent basis. So I didn't really know where the fish were. So now I have all this great live bait, but now I can't cover much ground because I'm now saddled with the live bait. What, what finally triggered the aha moment was I just heard about, you know, just about like the same types of lures I was using for bass fishing, like a shallow water lure for bass fishing is going to work great for saltwater. And so I just totally left the cast nets at home and I just made myself use lures. Now I was covering ground and that's when it hit me. That's when I found, okay, I just need to get into a good spot, use the same lures and, and covering ground, leaving the live bait, just totally not even bothering with it was the biggest advantage I, that I ever had on, in my early times of, of, uh, of inshore fishing. And, uh, and then like, and now to the point where I don't, I never, I haven't dealt with live bait for redfish trout or snook in, in a while and catch way more fish than I ever did. It reminds me of a little jingle, Justin. Um, oh boy. <laughs> every time every too time. early too early <clears throat> oh just right That's just it. right i didn't hit that i need like a little gazoo where i hit the key. <laughs> <laughs> simplicity specialist simplicity specialist yes it's, uh, so for me man like i i like researching a lot before i go fishing i i think i think what's interesting is that you know someone that's a bass fisherman that is so technically focused on what they do and they look at saltwater and they go, oh man, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know how to approach this. You got tides and you got fish I've never caught. And like, what do they eat? And what, what species, what bait fish are they eating at different times of the year? And, and it's funny, right? Because when you bass fish, you approach things so technically structure being the biggest thing, those depth contours and bass fishermen have so many different rigs on their boat and different presentations to fish with. And uh, they're already technically there. Like they know how to analyze a fishery and go out and be successful. But in some way, I, I, in kind of hearing you guys talk, I realize why it might seem intimidating. When you're, if you bass fish and you're successful at bass fishing, you've gone out, caught some fish, you can eight ball corner pocket and go fish a lake and say, I'm going to catch myself a couple bass. And you go out and you do it and you do it a couple of times. You build up this confidence and this familiarity with what you're doing and when you go to do something different, it kind of makes you nervous because you want your batting average to be high. You want to go out there and say, I know I'm a good fisherman. I know how to bass fish. I should be able to saltwater fish, but there's so many variables I've never dealt with before. I think they're nervous to make that leap. And if, if for people that are watching this, if you just take that beat and realize that you already have everything and just take it one piece at a time, it's not nearly as daunting as it seems. Structure and lure presentation, you've got that nailed down packed, you know, and you've got all the tools to go do it. Now you just figure out bait for me, I think was a big one. I didn't start saltwater fishing with live bait. I didn't have a cast net for the first five, six years of fishing in saltwater. So my view was, what are these fish eating? Like I know bass will eat a myriad of different species of, of bait fish, different times of the year. And that's the biggest key is what lure do you want to throw? What are you trying to imitate right now? So I'd go out with a shrimp presentation and I'd, I'd get a, I'd ask a couple of friends or tackle shops, what color or two or three colors should I take? Watermelon red, white, and a black and gold. And, you know, my first day going out and saying, okay, I need three lures and a shrimp presentation and a jerk bait. Like I, you know, that's what these fish are going to feed on. And where do the bait fish hide? Well, they're going to hide around structure and grass is a lot of area. So I found grass. I was using shrimp. I found redfish and I, I caught like 10 redfish my first day ever like really trying to figure out how to catch redfish. And I didn't really know. I, I was a big bass guy when I started. And I just, for me, I think what I liked was the little bit of research that, that helped me be successful was figuring out what are these fish feeding on and where can you find that bait fish? So bass guys are different times of the year. Do you fish hydrilla? Do you fish pads? Do you fish cattails? Do you fish you know, so many different things in different times of the year, those bass guys are, are fishing different types of structure. It's kind of the same in saltwater, but just take a minute to say, if they're eating shrimp, where do you find shrimp? If they're eating mullet, where do you, where do you find mullet? You know, and then and you kind of find the area to fish right there, because that's a, a lot of what we preach is 90% of these fish are in 10% of the water. And they're really following the bait structure and bait being the two biggest things. That's it. Structure and bait. I love it. Well, you too, you have like a degree in marine aquaculture or something. So you, it's kind of cheating. I wonder yeah, if you well, 15 redfish here. Uh, yeah. Le left brains, human, right brains, fish kind of thing. <laughs> Rob, what, what, going back to lures, 
Because I think that's so important. And, and you would share with me offline that, that they were like legit pros, like people who make a living fish catching bass, like some of the best in the whole world still had that same mindset going down to, let's just say Destin, Florida, wherever thinking, man, I got to get shrimp in order to catch a fish. Well, what are lures that you, what are your favorite crossover lures? Like maybe, you know, three of them uh, that, that you, you could say, all right, confidently, if you focused on structure and finding some bait in areas that are holding fish, obviously you can't catch fish in the dead zone. Uh, assuming you found an area that had some life, what are, what are just some no brainer lures that you don't have to replicate or get fancy with that you can catch bass and, and uh, let's just say redfish, trout, flounder, et cetera, with. There's a whole lot of them, but I'll, I'll shorten the list a little bit. My first experience with um, was with taking a bass lure to literally, I had to go down to a little town called Carabel to shoot some photos, some like sunset photos on a barrier island. Now, I'd never even put my bass boat in salt water. And I had rod, you know, my rods were with me. And I went down early to find the right place I wanted to take the photos and everything at. And I had like three hours to kill and there are docks and stuff all around. And, you know, just, I could see patches of grass and I just pulled a spinnerbait out and I started going down the bank and it was redfish, redfish, redfish. I mean, no giants or anything, no bull reds, but you know, like 15, 18, 20 inch redfish. So a, a spinnerbait, which I've always loved to throw anyway, is what got me started. I cool. started there. And then from there, the, the word just, oh, you can't believe what all you can catch. One of my favorite crossovers by far is a chatterbait. I mean, it is an amazing crossover lure. It's so versatile. I uh, like to take it and you can either leave the skirt on, on it. A lot of times just trim the skirt completely off and put whatever your favorite shrimp plastic is on there, a gulp or, you know, any kind of uh, shrimp imitation. Really, any you can, all, you can also use like uh, the diesel minnow type, you know, uh, boot tail swimmers like that. And you can do so much with it. You can wind it. You can let it go to the bottom. You can fish down through struggling fish docks with it. You can, you can target like that. And mainly you can cover so much water with it. But other, instead of like a spinnerbait, it's mostly up. With a chatterbait, you can kill it. You can let it go to the bottom. You can, you know, fish out a little deeper. And then, you know, beyond that, it's hard to beat like a top water. I mean, obviously that's a really good, you know, the trout, the redfish will bite top water. Of course, you guys got snook down there. Um, you know, other than that, uh, I, I used to take, I took all my, uh, another one of my favorites for sea trout is jerk baits, like the, the you know, like a uh, Rapala X wrap, or I even, it's crazy to take Lucky Crafts expensive lures down to the saltwater because you eventually lose them to toothy critters. But you know, some of the lucky craft stuff, but suspending jerk baits, that kind of, I've caught some really giant sea trout on suspending lures. So that's just a few to get started, but really you can go on with swim jigs. And I mean, I've gone down there and played with topwater frogs, hollow belly frogs. It's kind of comical to watch redfish try and eat them. It's, it's a challenge for them to really get it and get it in their mouth. Um, but it, that's the thing once you get down there and realize what's going on and you start looking at your tag your bass tackle box differently man i bet this will work yeah. i bet this will work you know and they right now as we talk i have a line of lures that i'm going to take down there uh you know this fall the, the what they call the the new uh they call it like the tokyo rig now where you it's almost like a heavy duty drop shot y'all probably seen those you know you put the bait on there but it's got a big and you can cast it really really far with the 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 lead goes down in the mud, more in the same, you know, places silty where your where your where your bait's getting lost. And you can tell the the fish can't really find it every time it goes in there. Um, man, once you do that, you open up. Once it starts happening to you, you open up that bass tackle box, and just there is there are no limits at that point. Love it. I, I love the terminology the bass guys use too. And you guys remember uh, the movie Joe Dirt? when uh he meets the guy that has the firework stand he's like guy. you mean to tell me you own a firework stand you don't have any whistle sticks and with, with or without the pickle shooter <laughs> like <laughs> we need to get justin i think you could be the guy to come up with an entire script of, of all <laughs> i gotta grow out a mullet first I've got, I've got the mullet wig i was joe dirt for halloween uh, once years ago so I forgot the wig for that it. that whole that that line is so good with yeah. or without the whistle stick or whatever he said. I don't even know what he says, but it's all there. And the wicks and bizzlers. 
<laughs> yeah, but, and and on the on the lure front, I think it's incredibly important. And I, I think the biggest lesson that that I've learned over the years, both myself and just just hearing and and working with with anglers who have are doing the transition, is that pretty much whatever lure you're using for bass on a certain depth and certain water clarity, use it for saltwater. Like literally, pretend you're bass fishing in salt exactly water right. you're going to crush it yeah. so like those lures you mentioned i don't ever use use any of them i know they work but uh for except for a frog so the, even doing <laughs> tournaments the old uh, trusty zoom uh the horny toad yep I, I this is my favorite top water when there's a lot of grass on the surface and i need to weed this top water and for skipping under mangroves in one tournament i literally placed a redfish and a trout against live bait people and i was using this horny toad um, so because it was a shallow running top water lure that was weedless, right? It's, I would use the same thing, bass fishing, just use it in salt water. And it's shocking how effective it is for redfish, sea trout, snook. And uh, they, they pretty much are like, they feed just like bass. They're, they're ambush predators. They feed on a variety of different prey. And as long as you have a good looking meal and put it at the right depth, whether it's shallow or deep, then uh, odds are they'll probably hit it. Yeah, I, yeah that's... That's spot on of what you say there, Luke. And, and what, what most bass fishermen might take for granted going into a salt environment is that they already know how to read. If you bass fish in, in any capacity, you know how to read water. You know how to read the seams, the lines, the potholes, you know, where sand meets silt, uh, a point. I mean, these are basic. This is not super complicated stuff it is the, the basics of bass fishing and usually I, i've taken several bass guys fishing for the first time it literally takes them an hour to catch on to exactly what we're doing it's it you know I, I i like to take them there especially if they've never done it because for the first hour i can look like a genius and then once they once they figure out it's the potholes or once they figure out it's where the current sweeping around the point and they know the bait that fits that situation, it's over with for me. They, they catch them on from catch them all from that point on. Yeah. And it, it goes back to structure, right? Wait, wait, wait. So points and ledges mm -hmm. and overhangs, right? And docks, all these it's it's all types of structure. It's uh and, and those bass guys, like we we fished with Mike Iconelli that one time, same deal, right? In the beginning, Luke and I caught you know a couple fish real quick, and then as soon as he he watches. And that guy can outcast us in his sleep. It was one of the smoothest things I've ever seen how he was skipping, you know, uh, underneath these docks and stuff. It was, it was so fluid. Uh, they're, they're amazing at casting, uh, which is a, a critical point. Um, I, I want to go down one other path because I think this is one of the, the other big reasons that bass anglers fail when they, when they uh, move over. And it's because this is what we did as well. And and we talked about this briefly in the Inshore Fishing 101 podcast. It was a podcast based on how to never get skunked, at least just to get some tight lines, not, not PBs, not even inshore slams, just to get catch fish, not get skunked. And, um, and it really comes down to just having too much power. And I know there's plenty of guys that love using 50 pound braid to catch a ditch pickle, but, but you don't need it. And, you know, Luke, I, I, sh I shared this with all you guys offline. Luke and I had that epic day of, of the doubling up a redfish. It was like catching, or we saw a hundred redfish in a small area. That was the title of, if you want to go watch it. And that same day I got home to our house in winter Haven and I ran into a guy who does bass fishing and I, he was like, how'd it go? And I told him and I showed him some pictures and I happened to have my, all my stuff there with me in the Tahoe. And he's like, oh, let me see where you use it. And I showed him, you know, I, it was a slam shady and it was the seven, six TFO rod and a 3000 series Daiwa reel. 10 pound braid and a 25 liter right that's it and he did not believe me like it, I, I, i'm showing i was like this is look at my i have nothing hitting my car i don't have some travel rod and I'm, like he's like there's no way you caught uh let's just say a, a 30 inch redfish with that setup like in his mind a catching a five pound bass and 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 then to see something that's way over five pounds at 30 something inches he's just like that's just not that's not possible. And I was like, what do you use? He's like, well, man, I wouldn't go out there catching redfish like that with anything, but you know, certainly have to have at least a 4,000 and, you know, 20 pound braid on there. And like, that's, that's the mindset. And I think 
it, Luke, we ran into that guy who's an insider member and we did, you know, part of that podcast was, was to help him. And so many people have that mindset. It seems the majority of people that come in with way too much power are, 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 are bass guys. Cause they just assume, man, if I'm using this to catch a five pound ditch pickle, I got to use something even bigger. Cause I, I might get a 40 inch snook, right. Or I, I might get a big old black drum and I got to have something that can overpower it. Uh, what, what do you guys think? My, Not about ditch pickles. Was, so like, I was kind of backwards. Like I started bass fishing with 10 pound monofilament and a whatever Walmart combo my dad got for me as a kid. And then I got into saltwater fishing and like learned the magic of 10 pound braid and how much 10 pound braid can really do, what kind of damage it can do. And then when I got into more of the competitive side of bass fishing, I was, I was on the UF collegiate bass team for about a year and a half. And I fished with some guys at Orange Lake up in Gainesville. And I knew people flipped and pitched with 50 and 65 pound braid in thick hydrilla, but I had a, I think I had like an Abu Garcia 6,500, like a C3, big old round bait, you know, round profile bait caster. And I was flipping with 30 pound braid and the guy on the boat's like, you're going to get broke off. And I'm like, please buddy, let me tell you what I can do with 10 pound braid. And sure enough, he pulls an eight pound and a nine pound fish out in front of me. And every bite that I had, I go to set the hook and braid with a Palomar knot straight onto a five aught extra wide gap worm hook. I wouldn't feel any resistance. And I pulled back barren braid and I'm like, whoa, 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 what do you mean? And it was kind of like the opposite, right? Like guys going from bass fishing into saltwater, they have this perception of what they think they need because of their, their view of, of what saltwater fishing is. And me, I'm like, I can get monster snook and redfish on 10 pound braid but I'm in open areas, open water areas where there isn't a lot of aggressive mm -hmm. structure. And on the flip side, I learned the importance of specifically when to use 50 and 65 pound braid. That's like one of the few instances, but I, I can kind of see it from both angles. You know, like I had this perception until I went out and I did it and I'm like, oh, that's why that's that way. But I can see why saltwater guys think it's such massive fish if I cut a fish half that size and I'm using tackle that's twice the beefiness, that's what I need to have for saltwater. Or I need something that's kind of in between, like maybe not 65 pound braid, but not like, you know, sewing thread. I need something in between. And that's why like 20 or 30 and a 4,000 because it's middle of the run average. And we're kind of like, you know, it's a paradigm shift. We're sharing that. We're, we're like pulling back the curtain to say, no, in actuality, this is all you really need. And and you can catch a ton of fish and it's a lot of fun. You know, it's, it's just, it's funny. Isn't and I, I know one of the first things I, I know one of the first things, I mean, uh, I did take initially true bass tackle down there, but as I started to really get into inshore fishing, the, the thing I did have to do was soften my actions. I was a, I always use like a medium heavy rod, a bass fishing or a heavy, you know, a heavy, medium, heavy, um, what I learned about redfish and trout and flounder is their attack, their mouths are just not as, a, a, a large mouth bass, that's why he's called that. And his volume of water that he sucks in when he strikes is pretty impressive. But you take a two pound large mouth bass, he still has a bigger mouth than a 30 inch redfish. And it takes redfish and trout, in my opinion, a split second longer to get a bait just because of the size of their mouth and the way they're coming at it compared to a, a bass's ball the way he can suck something in from three or four inches away is, is pretty incredible so in order to give fish more time I, I went to I dropped down the medium action rods was a huge you know and rods that had more not so much this little tiny fast tip and then all backbone, but had a little bit of medium that had a little bit more parabolicness to it just to give them the time to go to get the bait, to get it. And I noticed that, you know, a lot of the fish I started catching were hooked a little bit better, a little bit deeper in the mouth. And yeah, same with line. I mean, I came from bass fishing where everybody thinks you got to use 50 and 60, you know, pound tests to flip and stuff down there at Okeechobee. Um, um, and that. Oh, it's freezing up a little bit. You guys know that, oh, there we go. You know, inshore fish. One thing about uh, inshore fish 
have this unique way of staying just far enough out of your cast. I know you all, all experience this. So oh, yeah. casting since is a big deal. In uh, salt water, you use 12 and 15, that kind of, you know, 12, 15 pound test. Let's you know, um, no, go for it, Luke. 20, 20, 25 bass fishing. So yeah, softer action rod and... I was just going to reiterate the fact that, yeah, the casting is huge because uh, the, the unique thing with saltwater, with inshore saltwater, in most cases, the biggest fish are up in the shallowest water and, and, and bass fishing is not, not quite as consistently up in the shallows. So, so and when they're up in the shallows, they're up there to feed. They're also a little bit more exposed to, to predators. And, and so they're going to be a little bit more spooky. So distance is everything. Casting distance is crucial. It's the number one mistake. Like we've, we've interviewed a ton of guys over the years and I've taken out a ton of different people. And if you ask the, any guide, what's the, the biggest issue that if corrected, your, your clients would catch more fish casting. It's like, they don't even think about it. Casting, casting, casting. I, when I take people out, I immediately within the first 10 minutes, I know who's going to catch the most fish. It's whoever's casting the furthest and the most accurately is going to catch the most fish. And, and in particular with, with indoor saltwater, they're, they're spooky. So you can't have a super loud lure in many cases too. So you need to lighten up on the lures, which means you really need to lighten up on your, on your tackle. So I, I, when bass fishing, I was a bait caster only. I totally thought that anybody using spinning gear was, uh, were just newbies and didn't know what they were doing. They, they, they were only using them because they didn't know how to throw a bait caster. And I quickly learned the hard way that that's not the case. So I got totally owned by a buddy in college. I went fishing with him and his dad, Chip Tharp, if you're, if you're listening, thank you for the, the hard lesson learned. I brought my bass gear. I had to brought my big bait caster with, uh, with a 30 pound line on it. They were using these small little, little spinning tackle, spinning outfits. And they, they just totally owned me. I, I caught maybe like one fish to their 20. It was insane. And, uh, and it was just because I couldn't cast as far. I literally could see it vividly. I remember casting half the distance or maybe not that drastic, but it wasn't even close. And, uh, and so then I finally started using spinning gear again and went down to the light braid, like Justin was saying. Um, so now if I'm not fishing near hard structure, I, I, I always use 10 pound braid, no more, because that's all that's needed. And, and I did a casting contest, 10 pound braid on the same rod, the same reel, and then 20 pound uh, braid, same everything, same casting weight. And the 10 pound braid casted, it was like, it was about 20% better. And uh, in doing the math, it was every 15 casts, was an extra football field of coverage. And that's that's an extra football field of the best strike zone possible, right? The furthest away from you. So there's not much you can do to guarantee more fish catching than to be able to cover a football field of, of ideal strike zone territory in 15 casts. That's that's uh, that's game changing. It's huge. Um, let's talk about tides again. because That's a question that comes up a lot from, from bass anglers. Just really anyone who's just trying to get better and I, I know, I believe all four of us here on this call, you know, had either still are or have had Florida sportsmen for probably decades. And, and I, and we love Florida sportsmen. I actually just had a, a talk with them here pretty recently about maybe doing a collaboration of, of some sorts. Um, but at the time, like that was where you got your information. Right. And, and they, they kind of look, you, you probably know exactly where I'm going with this. They, they hammered one certain tide in particular, almost to the point where it, it, if you read all the articles, like a lot of us did, uh, you know, back in the really in the 90s is when that was like, that was the place to, to get us, you know, before the internet, there's no forums and stuff yet. And, and you read Florida Sportsman and a lot of, a lot of people would come away thinking, well, gosh, I can only catch fish in this one tide. And that would, you know, if someone asked, hey, what's the best tide, someone would instantly say, you, you remember what it is, Luke? Incoming, kidding me? Yeah, you got fish incoming. <laughs> like, why would you even? So, you know, people would let's just say you're a bass guy and, and you 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 had that mentality, that myth, because it's a myth, by the way. Uh, that oh gosh, I gotta plan all my trips and my vacation around the incoming tide, and and th that's not true at all. Um let, talk about that, all, all you guys, in terms of experience there and and maybe even some uh, some failures. I I used to think that. I could only catch fish on an outgoing tide Interesting. or low, like on the mm -hmm. other side of things. And then I had days on the water where the beginning of incoming, like going out on the opposite. Like I thought top of high tide fish in Sebastian Inlet, top of high tide fish in Nassau Sound in the Northeast part of Florida and Jacksonville. And that start of the outgoing tide, 
all the mullet would pop up all the all the predators would wait in ambush at, at a, you know at an exit point from like a main body of water and they would just have a heyday and then i always thought that the incoming tide i was like time to pack it up and have a sandwich oh. <laughs> and uh think about how many that- fish you missed <laughs> oh my gosh i had days where it's like bottom of low tide at, at 9 30 10 a.m on the flats and i'm fishing with my friend ty nelson and i'm in southwest florida and i'm like all right man time to go he's like wait 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 incoming tide starting i'm like yeah i know like i'm hungry it's time to get a sandwich we're not gonna, we're not gonna fish and he's like no 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 like i can tell you in the next 45 minutes redfish is gonna pop up there there and there and i'm like oh, okay that's cute and sure enough he called it and, it and I just completely changed my view of how I worked around the, the sweet spots of tides. I thought outgoing was king and the incoming was, oh, water's going to flood up and I won't be able to find fish. But it's about those sweet spots of the tides. It's about those little magical you know, periods at the top of a tide or near the bottom of a tide. There's windows of the tide that are good. As you mentioned, Rob, moving water in general, yes, moving water will start to move bait fish and move predators or congregate them at certain areas. But there are sweet spots of tides that I don't even think in a lot of these publications that we really realize that, you know, you can have good success on either end of the tide, incoming, outgoing, but there's certain particular parts of the tide that like can be two or three times better if you just time that right. And no one really, no one really talked about that. Yep, love it. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I I was just going to say that if you want to, I used to always go, one of the great things that helped me with tides, bottom line, was reading them on the graphs, on the charts. Instead of, you know, I know guys come down, they're like, okay, I got my tides. said, you got your tides? Yeah, I got my tides. The highs at, let's see, 331 and the lows. And they just have the, I like looking at the waves. I have to have, and I have several tide apps, you can find them everywhere, that, that show how quick the water is going to come in, how, t- how high the tide's going to get. And that was really my first lesson that the steeper that is, the steeper that outgoing or ingoing is, typically the better the fishing is. The more it is just kind of flat, you don't get much tide for the day, there's not going to be much water movement exchange. Normally, it's not as good when it's like that. And I, you know, but, but I would never know that just looking at the, when they used to publish them old school, just the time, like the times of when high and low is, and you, you could look at what the numeric value is to see how high, but seeing it visually now, when they draw it out on the, on the, you know, on the graph is it helps me a bunch. And the other thing too, is like anymore, I have certain locations and really I've got two different boats for two different tides. I mean, um, I know, I I know what you're getting at, Justin, in terms of having especially places that are just really good low tide places. And where I live, I have a tunnel boat just for that. Everybody tell you, well, that low, that negative low tide will be no good. Well, it's really good if you can get back into a creek, jump a sandbar and get back into where they're all pinned up or into a pothole where they've all been pulled into. So for every tide that somebody will tell you that tide is no good, there is a place that you can fish where that part of the tide is good. And what you learn in time is that, you know, like when the flood tides come, I like to go up in in the stuff and actually flip it like a bass fisherman, like go up in there with them and, and flip, you know, water comes up two feet and floods back and all that stuff. And but I would never do that on a low tide. So, but, but for people that are just beginning the, the whole velocity of the tide, I think is where you start and, and, and how much water flow you're going to have and whether it's basically coming in or out because most bass fishermen know how to read current seams, how it flows out of a Creek or when it's coming in a Creek and going around a point or something like that. Yeah, I agree. I think you nailed it in that there's it's the there's the velocity of is of water movement. It's the current flow, not the tide. I think and, and the biggest lesson I learned, and, and if even teaching people, we have a redfish mastery course and, and just have to really just just try to knock out the premise that 
what's the best tide? That's a question that happens all the time. And the answer should always be, there is no such thing. You might as well be chasing a unicorn because there's no such thing as the best tide, right? It'd be cool if there was, right? I'd love to see a unicorn. I'd love for one tide to always be the best. You'd like to see a unicorn? Case. Oh, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's not something I thought a guy with a, a beard and long hair would say, but you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever <laughs> not, now there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but but i mean it, it just it's just not it's never, never gonna be the case because every spot's gonna be different it's, it's all about how the current flow impacts a certain spot is usually going to be on uh, be the determining factor of what spots because like justin you mentioned the outgoing tide because you were re, you were most efficient in inlets which in that case in that situation the end of the outgoings you know the the turns of the tides are usually the best for for fish in the bays we were getting a lot of help from from live bait people and uh fishing like bull bay like back in like charlotte harbor and for their type of fishing in their area right the type of fishing in the type of spot it was the top of the incoming that they liked because that's when the fish would pull up right along the mangroves they could they could pitch some white bait on popping corks keep them right there there's mangroves and that's the that's the highway for those fish at that time but but it turns out like for artificial lures kind of the hardest time to catch fish so now the top of the incoming is my least favorite because now those fish are way harder to access. I, I prefer the the uh, the outgoing. So it's the the, the false premise is uh, is just that just please do not spend time and effort in planning your trips around the best tide because there's no such thing. I, if only I learned that five years sooner than I eventually did, uh, I would have so much so much so many more fish would have been caught. And and uh, and we were planning we were planning trips around around just tides, and and we probably missed out on some amazing amazing opportunities to catch a bunch of fish because we were just so one-sided love it. that's good cool anything else i i because i know we could probably make a couple of uh, different podcasts about this any other uh big mistakes myths etc i will say the biggest hardest lesson i had to learn coming from bass fishing to saltwater fishing and you guys will totally understand this it'll sound weird the way i describe it Saltwater fish are far more social. And what I mean by that is bass fishing, bass are not always loners, but they are much more loners. In other words, you can go flip one lay down, there'll be one bass that lives there. Or flip some dock pilings and there'll be one or two bass that live there. I think no matter, any bass fisherman can tell you that one go-to spot. That one go-to cove, that one that one go-to area that, that he can go catch a bass. Saltwater fish are much more school-oriented, uh, much more together in a pack. And if you're not getting bit, if you're not seeing bait, if you're not getting bit, move on fast. I can't tell you, I can already tell you the way Luke's nodding his head, I can tell we as bass fishermen go in salt. We've all saw, sat in that one creek or cove that we, God, it just looks so good. I can't wait. They got to be in here. Saltwater fish, if they're not there, they are not there. It's not like they'll kind of be there or there may be one or two. Hmm. They move together. And it took me pain, a long, painful time to understand that. If you're not getting bit, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, because you'll eventually land on where they are at. So. Yeah, and that's and that's why I think artificial lures is so powerful, especially for somebody getting new where they, they don't have their their exact spots. They, they don't have the spots where those schooling fish are usually going to be because now you can cover ground. And, and yes, it, as yes. long as you're picking spots with structure, you're, you're just going to skyrocket the odds of coming across that. Even if you don't know exactly how they behave on changing tides or or anything like that, if you just cover a lot of ground and cover a lot of water with structure, you just said so that's a numbers game right you're eventually going to going to come across them like you said um the fit if they're schooling fish in many cases they're they're pretty aggressive right they have to fight for their meals there it's not like a loner bass that can sit there and watch a thing for a while to to think of it's food or not if that redfish doesn't doesn't act quick either its buddy's going to get it or that or that that bait fish is going to be swimming off so uh, yeah covering I, I i think you nailed it that's the number one that i'm with if you can cast well and cover ground i mean the the there's just so much opportunity to catch a ton of fish, even fishing areas you've never been to before. And that's how you discover really good areas too, is 100%. you find places at the right, you're there at the right time. 
and and this will particularly uh, bass fishermen will like this. What makes one thing I love about the inshore game is that when you find talking about these tides in these schools, when you find an area that's right on a right tide, the the great thing about it is I know it sounds terrible, but it disappears. And anybody else that comes through there will not do any good until they hit that place at the right time, at the right tide. And that's what makes it short because you can literally have spots that are, that are to yourself that are in plain sight, but they only get right at a good time. And I think that those are all things that bass fishermen already know in the back of their head. But when they, when they get out there and see it develop and see it happen, it, it just will not take most bass fishermen very long to dial in and figure it out and get on that train. I love it. Hopefully this uh, helped simplify things for uh, not just bass anglers, but anyone, anyone new who's been, you know, fishing at all. I mean, there's obviously we use largemouth bass because it's probably the, the most universal fish in the freshwater side in the, in America. Uh, but you know, it could be walleye or whatever the heck you're into and you're just struggling like, man, I, I can't figure this out. I mean, go back to the structure, right? Uh, go back to finding bait. We, we call it the three B's birds, bait and, uh, and boils and, um, and just simplify it. Uh, there is no perfect tide. You don't have to overpower and have, you know, the monster 4,000 or 6,000 series spinning reel and 50 pound braid. Uh, and you don't even need new lures. You don't even need a new boat. Uh, you don't really have to change that much. Uh, and, and, and even the whole, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah. I, you don't need a whole lot of, uh, like bass fishing, you know, you, you, you gotta feel like you gotta have 10 or 12 or 13, 15 <laughs> rods and, yeah. and you gotta rig them up that night and takes hours to rig up, uh, you know, all, everything is wacky rigs and the, just, it, there's so many options where, I think we can all agree that you can basically take three rods to salt water and have your bases covered. Yep. I mean, just some real basic, a spoon, a top water, a jig, you're good. I mean, you can, you can fish from Virginia to Texas with three outfits. And when you talk about simplify, that's a, that's a great point there. Love it. Now it's spot on. Um, I love that. Uh, what were some other ones? Uh, I don't need live bait. Obviously you do not. I mean, we've had, we've had more fun and have caught more fish not using live bait than we did when we were using live bait. And, and, and certainly there are times when you want to use live bait. We don't poo poo on live bait. I mean, Peter Deeks, he's got world records. And if probably if you're trying to set a world record or a state record, live bait's tough to argue with. But in terms of just getting tight lines and having control and having freedom and being able to go out there and, and fish quickly and cover lots of ground, use artificial lures, especially if you're a, a bass guy or gal and you know how to cast and you're already somewhat confident catching fish with a lure, keep using them. And, and on the flip side, you know, I, I told you I went bass fishing uh, earlier this week, caught a couple, and I used my exact same saltwater stuff. So it it, it, it also goes the, the same way. I, I literally took one rod and uh, and one just a paddle tail lure using everything the same. And and no, I wasn't pitching into really thick stuff, uh, but this is a good time. You were there, come up a little bit shallow, and, and I had a great time just catching some some bass in shallow water with a little paddle tail and a weighted uh, twist luck hook. So uh, so much crossover there. And we'd love to hear your feedback on this. If you, uh, like, you know, more of, uh, more of these and, and more of Rob, if we could do some, uh, anything on the water stuff, I know is a question we hear about a, a, quite a bit. Uh, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. We, uh, we obviously put all of these podcasts at saltshore.com in the fishing tip section. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, you're more than welcome to leave a comment, but if you really want us to read it and get back, definitely put it over there at saltshore.com in the fishing tip section, you'll see the actual blog post and those comments come directly to us and we're quick to get back to them. Anything else guys you can think of? Crickets? I think it's a, I think it's a good start. They're like, yeah. I, like you said, Joe, there's from here, you can splinter this off so many ways. There's so many things you can talk about um, in the crossover. I think we just, you know, kind of scratch the surface here maybe open some people's eyes. I do know that, you know, from my experience, lakes are getting a lot more crowded. Um, they're not just with fishermen, but water skiers and jet skiers. I think I haven't ever, I haven't talked to a cert, single person 
and hasn't agreed that since COVID hit, our outdoor resources have really become the places to go. Our lakes, our impoundments. And, you know, one thing about inshore fishing that I enjoy is the elbow room. If you're tired of the jet skis, if you're tired of, uh, you know, all on a lake, it's all, I don't know why it is. Some of the lakes you go to, like Lanier and Lake of the Ozarks, have some of the biggest boats I've ever seen in my life on these lakes. It's crazy, these giant boat wakes, and you're fighting that stuff all the time. If you're tired of that, if you want to get away, if you want to reel in some fish without seeing another boat, the inshore is where that's possible. Yep, and the opportunities are endless, mm -hmm. right? Because that was for, we were bass guys, and we thought it was the coolest thing ever, and I still love catching bass, but – we were down at Marco Island. That was the first time I remember like catching big. I'm talking like, you know, legit 15, 20 pound snook. And I was like, I can't believe it. And we were on a sandbar. We were literally in wading boots. And I was like, I can't believe this is happening. And, and, and who knows what you're going to catch. I mean, we caught some big sharks and stingrays. And we we're just like, man, you, every cast, it's almost like scratch off tickets or, or, you know, at the <laughs> casino, you just, you never know. And it's really exciting versus if you're throwing a certain worm or, uh, you know, whatever it might be, a Ned rig uh, in a bass area, you know, for the most part, you're going to catch a bass. Uh, I think it's so exciting just not knowing what you're going to catch. Justin, you want to say true. something? You? I mean, I just keep thinking of Steve Jobs. Like, how does anybody know what they want if they've never seen it before? Like, Bassin might have <laughs> never seen a Ned Rig or a swim jig before. Or, I'm sorry, a Redfish may have never seen that before. It's going to be so rewarding when you do finally catch one on the setups that you already have. So that's half the fun, too, guys, is doing things that people might not normally traditionally do but it may be the next big thing. You know, we may find out like, oh my gosh, swim jigs are legit. Like everybody <laughs> needs one. So yeah. go on and do it. That's, that's, it's, it's so much more rewarding. Yep. Love it. Cool. Well guys, hope you enjoyed this one. Definitely join us in the insider club. One big reason is we simplify everything from where to find the fish that, that 90 10 zone is critical. And, and it's, it's the same in bass. It's the same. If you took a lake, about, you know, 90% of the, the feeding bass are going to be in around 10% of, of any kind of area or areas. And it's the same thing in saltwater fish. We just make it simple for you by every week, showing you where those places are, what types of places they are. Every single week, we get on live calls. We get on Zoom calls like this. We do recorded ones where we get on satellite maps and literally show you like talking about like a shortcut. It's like having a fishing guide on speed dial to say, Hey, what kind of area should I fish this week? And in 10 minutes or less, they will tell you exactly where you should fish. And just as importantly, what to fish with, like what depths are going to be, uh, be holding in and then give you the tackle at 20% off or more. So, and, and we simplify it too, by not having some bash pro tackle store with 150,000 different, uh, options of, of jig heads. We're like, here's what you need. It like, we we absolutely want to simplify. We'd love to say you a bunch of crap, Actually, we, we, would, we wouldn't, and this doesn't do much good. We try to like literally make it so simple and say, this is all you need to go out there and consistently catch fish. Because I'll be honest, when I go into places like that, like these big monster, big box stores, I'm intimidated when I see they have an entire aisle of just jig heads. I'm like, what in the world? How, like, why is there so many choices when you only need a couple? And so we've simplified the entire process for you. And we have little cheat sheets to say, all right, if you're going to go out and catch your first intro slam, here's exactly what you need. And just as importantly, here's the stuff that you don't need. So we just try to simplify it, helping you save time and money. And if that sounds like you, it's, we, we attract a lot of people who, who are bass fishermen, including Luke and I, Tony, who's on our team. That was his story. He, he found us before we found him. He was a frustrated, ticked off bat ex bass fisherman, as we like to call him. And uh, he was trying to master saltwater fishing. He could only catch catfish. He's like, man, I'm just catching catfish. And I finally was the point, all right, I'm going to join this club and study what they're talking about and see if it really works. And obviously you guys know the rest of the story. He now, he now gets paid to fish. Uh, he had such a transformation. So it's, it absolutely works. You got to put some work in. It's like anything. You can't just you know, sign up for a gym membership and lose 30 pounds in the first week by signing up, you still got to show up and put some work in. But when you do, it is amazing how well it works. And we have story after story. It's saltstrong.com forward slash pricing, or just go to saltstrong.com if you're listening to this 
and look for a little button that says join. Join today for you current members. Thank you guys so much. Let us know anything else you want us to cover. Uh, let us know if you have questions for Rob. We'll obviously forward them on uh, there. And, uh, and, and we certainly want to come up with some more of these because it's, uh, it's fun and, and it's important. And it's obviously super, super helpful and applies to a lot of people here in, uh, in, in, in America. So thank you guys so much for all the love, all the support. And we'll chat with you on the next episode. Peace, we out. Whoop, whoop.